Good afternoon and welcome to our recap of the 86th legislative session. This was truly a consequential session for local governments and we are excited to have an all-star panel of legislative experts to help us break down what went on under the pink dome this year. Uh, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items I wanted to go over. First, if you have any questions as we go through this, please type them into the comment box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, given the amount of information in our presentation, we don't expect to have time to address them during the webinar. Uh, therefore, we'll respond to any questions in a follow-up email after the webinar. Also, at the end of the webinar slides, you'll find email addresses for each of the panelists, and you can reach out to us individually. This webinar has been approved for one hour of MCLE credit from the State Bar of Texas and New York, as well as CPE credit. If you'd like to request MCLE or CPE credit, we'll also give you the opportunity to do so in our follow-up email. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you by email as well as post it to the Bracewell website. Now let's get started. My name is Jonathan Frells. I'm a partner in the Houston office of Bracewell. I serve as bond counsel, disclosure counsel, and underwriters counsel in public finance transactions for a broad spectrum of state and local governmental issuers. And I'll be serving as a moderator for today's panel. We couldn't be more pleased to present this all-star cast of legislative experts that represent the full spectrum of local governmental entities and those who do business with state and local governmental entities. These panelists were truly and deeply engaged in all of the major issues facing local governmental bodies this session, and their insights should be both useful and entertaining. First, I'd like to introduce Amanda Bronson. Amanda has been working in the public education sector for 25 years and in Texas school finance for 15. She's recently served as the director of state funding at the Texas Education Agency, where she oversaw the distribution of the state's nearly $20 billion foundation school program. Prior to joining TEA, she worked as a consultant at Moak Casey and Associates, where she assisted school districts with revenue projection, conducted research, and provided legislative support. Currently, she's the Associate Executive Director of Governmental Relations for the Texas Association of School Business Officials. Amanda was an incredible resource on school finance and debt matters during the session. Next, I'd like to introduce Shanna Igo. Shanna is the Deputy Executive Director for Policy Development and Legislative Services for Texas Municipal League, where she coordinates and implements the legislative policy programs for the 1,160 member cities and their mayors and council members. She's been with TML for 31 years, and prior to her work at TML, she worked with the Texas Senate as a legislative aide and the committee director for the Senate State Affairs Committee. To say that Shanna is actively involved in the legislative process on behalf of Texas municipalities would be a massive understatement. Finally, I'd like to introduce Rick Dennis. Rick is with Hillco Partners, where he focuses on assisting the firm's clients in many critical areas of public policy. Prior to joining Hillco, Rick worked for 12 years in the Texas House of Representatives in varying capacities. He served nine of those years as the Chief of Staff for Texas State Representative Tan Parker. Rick also acted as the Committee Director for the House Committee on Investment and Financial Services. This past session, we had the chance to work with Rick on a number of local government and finance matters uh, in connection with his work for the Coalition for Responsible Infrastructure Finance. With those introductions out of the way, let's dive into the meat of the webinar. First, we wanted to lay out the objectives that we hope to accomplish today. In addition to providing an opportunity for free sale e-credit, we really hope to provide context for what happened during the session, provide an overview of some of the major legislation affecting the municipal market participants, provide some insights into how new legislation will affect governmental bodies and those who do business with them, and provide some insights as what we can expect as we move into the interim and to next session. As we start looking at general themes for what happened during the 86th legislative session, um, they break down generally in this manner. First, we had unprecedented alignment among the governor, lieutenant governor, and speaker in how they would address issues that came up this session. This was a significant departure from what we saw during the 2017 legislative session and allowed a lot of activity to take place very early in the session and be focused on the priorities that those three had agreed on. Second, we had a, re a reduced emphasis on social issues. We didn't deal with the bathroom bill and some of the other items that really derailed session back in 2017. And this allowed the legislature to focus on a lot of blocking and tackling on basic governmental entities. Unfortunately, 
much of that blocking and tackling was ultimately focused on local governments. And we'll talk about how that affected state and local governments as we move into the uh, presentation today. Major priorities for the session were property tax reform, which we saw in SB2 and HB3, and school finance reform, which was really the, the focus of HB3. These items took up a significant amount of the legislature's attention during session, and there were incredibly significant changes that were associated with those. Next, another theme that we saw overall was a, a continued focus on limiting the authority of local governmental um, entities. Uh, this is something that we've seen since 2013, and it continues to increase each session uh, in, in the severity of what, what you see with respect to the limitations on those authorities. Uh, as Again, as we've seen since 2013, there's been a continued significance of debt and transparency as topics. Uh, that are dealt with during the legislative session. And we've got a number of bills related to that that we'll discuss uh, today. But the legislature is, uh, continues to be very focused on how much debt local government issues and how that's presented to voters. And finally, in the first session after Hurricane Harvey, um, there was an incredibly large focus on flood control. Um, and we saw that in a number of bills that passed, some constitutional amendments that have been proposed, and the use of the rainy day fund. With some of those general discussions out of the way, I'd like to start by asking Shanna if she can give us some impressions of what the environment was like for municipalities during this legislative session. Um, well, in a word, a very technical legal word, it sucked. Um, the authority of local governments, particularly cities, was under um, assault like we've never seen before. Uh, a lot of that, uh, the speculation is because it is seen that the, that the mayors of the large cities are Democrats. And when you have the leadership being Republican, there's a lot of speculation that it was a, a partisan effort. Uh, there was preemption bills that preempted cities from anywhere from setting their budgets to what ordinances they can enforce, to what uh, amount they can annex or zone, to how many chickens you can have in your backyard. So it kind of ran the gamut of what the state felt like they knew better. If you talk to city officials, what they will tell you is that the functions that they are required to perform are not Democrat or Republican. A pothole is not D or R. Neither is providing police service, neither is fire service. That those are just all issues that we simply must have to live with every single day. So um, regardless of if it is partisan politics or if it's just the way it was, um, you have a lot of legislators saying that, yes, we believe in local control. We don't believe in out of control. Um, and if you look at the legislators, that's a, a belief a lot have. You uh, talk to city officials, they believe that they are simply trying to have their community look like what the citizens want, and that's to elect their mayors and council members to run their particular um, city. So um, uh, it w was actually not as bad this session as it was uh, last session in 2017. And we hope that as things proceed, that cities will come less and less under assault from the state legislature. And Amanda, this was a huge district for school districts as well. What were some of the general themes that you saw from a school context? The three big themes as it relates to public education really were, uh, number one, shifting the um, burden of financing public education from the local property tax to a more equal share between state and local uh, governments. I think addressing teacher pay in some fashion, and then doing something to the school finance formula to address the criticism that it's outdated. So those were, all three of those things really had to be included in a bill for it to be considered a success. And then I think um, in terms of the education side or the program side, a focus on reading, a focus on student outcomes, and a focus on uh, pre-kindergarten, really all three of those were primary. Right. And so, so Rick, as, as, as someone who watched the session this year, it seems like it was really active. How, how did this session compare to uh, past sessions? Very active. Uh, very active both in the speed in which it seemed to reach its peak point. Usually it feels like legislative sessions don't reach their full scheme ahead point until maybe mid to late March. This session certainly felt earlier. I think you could have assigned that, that uh, full speed point to be early February but also very active in the sense of how many measures were filed, how many measures were ultimately considered and enacted into law, how many measures were vetoed by the governor once the session ended. And of course, the, the slide deck has specific statistics on those uh, marks. Great. Um, 
as we before we move into the actual highlights of the legislation that passed this session and how it'll affect uh, a number of our entities, I, let's talk a little bit about the constitutional amendments. Um, Texas voters are going to have 10 constitutional amendments to vote on this session as a result of joint resolutions that were passed. Uh, we picked six of them in the uh, packet that you've got that we wanted to call to your attention. And, and I would say recent history shows that virtually every constitutional amendment that makes it to the ballot passes. These are real low turnout elections, and people generally feel that if they've made it through the legislature, um, then it's probably something that we're, we're okay with. So uh, here are some of the majors that we wanted to call to your attention. First is House Joint Resolution 4. Uh, it would create new flood control infrastructure fund to assist in the financing of drainage, flood mitigation, and flood control projects. Uh, and it passed Senate Bill 7, which we'll talk about later, will implement that constitutional amendment. House Joint Resolution 12 would authorize an increase in the maximum state general obligation bond authority for the benefit of the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute from $3 billion to $6 billion, which um, seems amazing to me because uh, CPRIT was under constant assault uh, just five or six years ago. And so this is a pretty big rebound to go from people looking at doing away with CPRIT entirely to adding an additional $3 billion of, uh, of authority. Um, HJR 34 would temporarily lower ad valorem taxation of a property damaged during a declared disaster. Uh, House Joint Resolution 38 would ban the creation of a state income tax unless passed by a two-thirds majority in the Texas House and Senate and approved by a majority of the Texas voters. HJR 151 would increase from $300 million to $600 million the amount the general land office can distribute uh, from the available school fund. And finally, SJR 79 would authorize the Texas Water Development Board to sell additional bonds to provide financial assistance for the, assistance for the development of water supply and wastewater facilities in economically distressed areas. For all of you guys on the panel, is there anything that stands out about these amendments that are being proposed or anything that didn't pass this session? One of the provisions they, they didn't end up addressing was uh, there, there was no constitutional amendment to adjust the frozen tax levy for citizens, homeowners over age 65. And so as you see school district tax rates decline over the next two years, uh, those folks may not see a reduction in their tax bill. So that's something I'll be curious to see if they decide to address next session. One that really kind of caught my attention was the amendment to further prohibit a state income tax. And, and reason being is that particular amendment has been filed in previous sessions, and it just demonstrates how the agenda continues to evolve from session to session, because I can remember sessions 2007, 2009, where that particular amendment proposal got little to no attention in the legislature and now not only is it passed and put before the voters but it is touted by this legislature as one of the major accomplishments of the session so is the is the reason behind that that they look out in the future and see that there's going to be a future need for additional income for things like school finance reform and they want to focus the efforts in in different directions rather than a state income tax i think that's in part um Yes, answer to your question, I would offer just my own sort of opinion hypothesis as well as it provided a good red meat issue to tackle and to be responsive to the constituency that most put this legislature into office. And as Shanna mentioned earlier, property tax reform was really a major focus of this session. Uh, the two bills that are really supposed to deliver that reform are Senate Bill 2 and House Bill 3. Uh, Shanna, let's start with uh, SB 2. Can you tell us a little bit about what that does? Yes, Senate Bill 2 it made a lot of changes to the process for the adoption of the property tax rates by local governments. Uh, one thing to be very clear about is that it is not effective until January 1st, 2020, so your budget for this year needs to continue as is. Uh, so you've got a, about another year in order to make those adjustments. Uh, on a side note, Texas Municipal League will be having webinars on specific implementation of Senate Bill 2. Uh, you can check our website to see when those are because this is going to be very difficult and um, uh, to implement. Uh, some of the highlights of what Senate Bill 2 does and doesn't do, um, 
The rating agencies during the process of Senate Bill 2 were very vocal about saying that this will be seen as a credit negative. Uh, we have seen since the bill passed and was signed into law that this is in fact true. Uh, your bond ratings will probably be downgraded, which will in turn be a, a higher cost for your individual taxpayers when they're going to repay those debts. One thing that was included in the bill for a long time was the fact that uh, your certificates of obligation were going to be considered part of um, how you calculate your uh, property taxes. That provision was eventually removed from the bill, which was a big blessing for anyone who does issue COs because you will continue to be able to do that without any penalty. So that is a, a bullet that we certainly dodged. One thing that the bill does is uh, rename the rollback rate, so you will no longer refer to it as the rollback rate, but you will call it the voter approved rate, and that is because the voters will, in most cases, be able to approve the tax rate, which will go from 8% down to 3.5%. Uh, the bill was filed at 2.5, so at least this is a 1% increase in the bill as filed, and it applies to most taxing units. There are special taxing units that it will not apply to, and that is a school district, Junior college, hospital district uh, are the main ones, and for cities under 30,000 in population. One good thing that we were able to convince the legislators of is that there needed to be a carryover of that unused increment amount that you adopted for your M&O rate, that you can roll that, that rate over for up to three years. Uh, so that will be a good thing. One thing that we cautioned the legislators about is that if that happens, you will probably have most entities go up to 3.49 every year in order to make sure that they have money in their budgets to uh, to meet the constituents' needs. And so cities that have currently not gone up to 3.49, it will be a tax increase. Um, other things, when I talked about earlier, that cities with less than a population of 30,000 will need to calculate a de minimis tax rate and what that will end up being is it will amount, it will allow a city to collect an amount equal up to $500,000. And true to form, that will be a significant tax increase for numerous small cities. There are probably over uh, 700 cities that are below 5,000 in population. So for a majority of those cities, it will be a, a, an increase in the amount of revenue that they will be able to spend. There is also a mandatory election that's required in November on the new November uniform election date for all special taxing units and for cities with populations of 30,000 or more. So that will, it's why it will be called the voter approved rate is because the voters will have to go in and will be able to make that option if they want an 8% rollback rate or a 3.5% rollback rate. Um, another very interesting thing that was in Senate Bill 2 is that uh, during the testimony, it was brought out that a lot of cities have collective bargaining or civil service contracts with their police and fire with their first responders. And so the solution to that was to say in law that a city cannot lower the compensation from the previous year for first responder salaries or other compensation or other benefits. We do know from two cities in particular that they will go way above their 3.5 that very next year in the year 2020 because of the benefit package that they had already promised their first responders. So it'll be interesting to see what cities actually have to cut after that. There's a lot more transparency, more open government, a lot more requirements to make sure that the public is aware. We did not oppose any of those, nor would we ever, because we think that the more that the public knows, the more that the citizens know, is a good thing as far as cities uh, setting their budget. What are the real effects of this? We have had numerous city finance officers, city managers, mayors, and council members tell us in um, three to four years, if not even by next session, certainly by 2023, that cities will be in dire straits as far as trying to fund the necessary um, uh, services that the citizens have come to expect. Um, we'll only know that for sure when we get to 2023. It'll be interesting to see in 2021 if we start seeing that trend, but that is where, where we feel like we're headed and that's kind of a synopsis of where Senate Bill 2 is at this point and what passed. So the other, the other major piece of legislation that addressed property tax reform and school finance reform uh, was HB3. And uh, Amanda, no one's more steeped in HB3 than you, maybe much to your chagrin, <laughs> um, but uh, can you talk, talk to us a little bit about what uh, HB3 will mean? First and foremost, um, as we calculated, the bill cost about $11.3 billion over the biennium, so it's an important and significant investment. 
both in increased spending for public education and also in slowing the growth of the local property tax. Um, of that, we estimate about $5 billion really is going toward the reduction in the local property tax or beyond what uh, the, the rate it would have grown to. Um, and then we think there's about $3.2, $3.3 billion per year in increased um, funding available for school districts to spend. Um, we also think uh, the bill is likely to increase in cost going forward. Um, and so we think uh, as the property tax rate compresses, that's going to be an increase in cost to the state year over year. Uh, when we look at, at sort of where the investment goes, about 40 percent, between 40 and 50 percent of the investment over time will go towards that slowing the growth of the local property tax uh, with the remain, remaining uh, 60 to 70 percent. Uh, going to increase funding for schools, and remember that a third of that increased investment in schools um, was earmarked for an increase in compensation, primarily in compensation uh, for teachers, um, but also uh, for some other staff at the school district level. Um, one thing to to realize is that the, the bill is a, a really significant change in the way schools are funded. Uh, so you see uh, a lot of allotments going away that used to be inside the foundation school program. Uh, some of the allotments that used to be there have changed in terms of their delivery mechanism, um, and then some, some new allotments. And so you see school district uh, CFOs across the state trying to very quickly get their arms around uh, how much this means for their school district so that they can estimate the required pay raise for teachers. So, so Amanda, are there when when you look at it among school districts, are there some winners school districts and some losers among school districts? There, there's um, very uneven gains in the bill. There are a couple of what the legislature is calling transition grants, which is really kind of the new term for what we used to call a hold harmless provision um, that that mostly but don't quite prevent any losses. Um, you do have a handful of districts that, in spite of those uh, transition grants, lose. Um, under the terms of the bill, but, but that's a rare, rarer event. Um, but you don't see even gains across the state. And so you'll see some districts with really large gains um, giving very significant pay increases and other districts maybe gaining two or three percent. Um, and, and then uh, what that's creating across the state is an interesting competition for staff um, because what drives salary expenditures in Texas is not just what the legislature tells school districts to do, but what they have to do in order to attract and retain staff. So that's been an interesting um, piece of the puzzle going forward. Um, so that's been a real challenge to staff because all of those provisions really um, become effective right away in the first year of the biennium. So that's, that's been an interesting uh, challenge. And, and before we move on, can, can we talk a little bit about what the tax rate compression will mean for both taxpayers and, and districts? Sure. So, so what you'll see uh, this year is that uh, tier one tax rates for most districts uh, dropped from a dollar uh, to 93 cents. And so you see roughly seven cents of tax reduction um, in most districts across the state, but even that is not even. Uh, there were some low taxing districts that actually the way the, the bill was implemented probably are encouraged to go up a little bit on their tax rate. And you'll see other districts that were at a higher tax rate that will, you'll see their rates fall by more than those seven cents. Um, and, and that's all uh, happening sort of right away. Um, but the other interesting provision is the bill provides for continuing and ongoing property tax rate reduction um, so that the idea would be that the school district tax levy for maintenance and operations uh, shouldn't be expected to grow by more than 2.5%. And so one of the things we're going to see is an increased role for the Texas Education Agency in the setting of those tax rates. They're directed in statute to actually calculate the tier one tax rate for every school district. And they are right now sort of working through how to gather all that data uh, that they would need in terms of each district's property value in time to calculate those rates so that school districts can adopt the rates, set budgets, and hold tax ratification elections as necessary. So all that will be unfolding uh, over the course of the next year. Um, the other thing that they did that was pretty significant in the setting of tax rates um, first of all, we think most tax ratification elections will happen on the November uniform election date. There is still technically a May uniform date, but we don't think the timelines will really allow for anyone to use it. Um, and uh, districts will have to have an efficiency audit prior to conducting that tax ratification election um, and post the results of that audit. 
Um, there is also a provision in statute that says school districts may not increase their MNO tax rate for the purpose of creating a surplus in order to pay debt service on bonds. So to the extent that school districts were doing what they used to call swaps or swap and drops, where they really were counting on that M&O money to move over to the debt service side, it, it feels like that's being specifically addressed in this legislation. And, and looking out into the future, if we have some further compression, mm -hmm. um, how, how will the revenues, uh, where will the revenues come from to pay for what's going on in the schools in light of that, that further compression? The way the, the system is set up, the district's tier one tax rate will fall, and when that happens, their local share of the cost of tier one falls at the same time. And so the, the way that's supposed to work is state aid will sort of automatically flow in to make up the difference, or recapture will fall to make up the difference. The interesting thing to watch for will be, you know, as we get four and six years out, sort of um, how have we paid for enrollment growth during that time because um, as a state, we've gotten pretty used to relying on the local property tax to cover that cost. Um, the earlier conversation about the prohibition on a state income tax, there's a conversation that will have to happen in Texas about revenues at some point. So nothing was actually identified during the session to pay for those future future costs? There's not really a new revenue source. Uh, there, there is the constitutional amendment that would allow for an increased distribution from the permanent school fund um, that will help in the short term. Um, but in terms of really a long-term revenue source that will um, meet the, the same demand that the property tax has met in past years, I'm not sure we're there yet. Okay. Yeah, well, that'll be very interesting to watch as uh, as we yeah. move forward. Um, another hot button topic during the session uh, was taxpayer funded uh, lobbying. Rick, can you talk to us about what what that is and and what uh, sure. what kind of legislation we saw this session? So the concept of taxpayer funded lobbying is generally defined as a public entity who levies a tax, having as part of their expenses a either a contract lobbyist someone who is not a direct employee of the entity um, are on, on hand to help out with their advocacy needs and or that entity belonging to an association that has um, what is defined in statute as lobbying expenditures. The prohibition on taxpayer funded lobbying is something that is very predominant in the Texas Republican Party platform. So it was not surprising to see numerous bills filed during this legislative session that sought to address it and address it in different ways. Obviously, Senator Hall filed his Senate Bill 29 and Mays Middleton filed his House Bill 281 to be, at least as they started out, very hard stop prohibitions on those entities um, engaging in, quote, taxpayer-funded lobbying. The reason that they supported those bills, and, and I should say the sincere reasons why they supported those bills, is uh, this contingent of lawmakers truly believe that those resources are better used to fund necessary public services and infrastructure, while at the same time, the, the role and the responsibility of advocacy to the legislature so that the legislature is up to speed with the opinions and needs of their local governments belongs with the people who are elected to lead those local governments, their school boards, the municipal councils, county governments, so, and, and, and whatnot. Other bills were filed on the topic, not necessarily to prohibit, but to uh, further regulate, uh, quote, taxpayer-funded lobbying. Particularly, Senator Betancourt filed a couple of bills to legalize it, keep it legal, but to require much, much more disclosure by the public entity as far as how much money they're spending, who they're hiring, um, to also require that any contracts have to be approved by a public vote of the governing board and such forth. As the session progressed, what we observed was the strict prohibitions is what started to gain steam instead of the further regulation. And I think that surprised some, myself included, to be honest. 
But, you know, much to the credit of people like Bob Hall and Mays Middleton, they proved to be very savvy in the legislative process, very savvy in how to negotiate the advancement of their legislation. And those bills really started to move uh, at the midpoint of session. Interestingly enough, as you started to get into April, you started seeing some of the chairmen on the House side go to social media and share their support for, if not banning, at least significantly reforming taxpayer funded lobby. Ultimately, what happened on the issue is the outright ban was passed in the Senate. However, when it came over to the House, which of course bills have to pass both bodies to become law, when it came over to the House, it was very narrowed to be a ban on only municipal uh, political subdivisions and county governments, and even at that, to only ban them for having lobbyists for the purposes of taxes and debt issuance. But they could continue to have lobbyists in any other areas that they felt like they needed to advocate. But even after the bill was very narrowed in that sense, it ultimately did not have the support in the House, so it was not passed. That does not mean, though, that nothing passed on this topic, because in the closing days of the legislative session, Senate Bill 65 by Senator Nelson and Representative Charlie Guerin was amended by Representative Capriglione to add to it a lot of what we saw in the Betancourt bill that I mentioned earlier, which was further disclosure. And that did pass into law. So while taxpayer, quote, taxpayer funded lobbying continues to be a perfectly legal form of advocacy, there is some additional regulations and disclosures uh, surrounding with it that political subdivisions do need to make themselves familiar with in the form of Senate Bill 65. Now, the question a lot of people hear from time to time or are already hearing is, is this issue going to come back next session? I would, uh, and, and Shannon, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but I would wager the opinion that yes, we will see this bill, re, you know, the, the prohibition refiled next session. For one thing, we do know that Senator Bob Hall will be back. He is not on the ballot, so he is already reelected and will be here for 2021. And right now, it, it, Mays Middleton appears to be in very, very good position to reclaim his seat and also be a member of his chamber for 2021. So you got the two primary authors coming back. That's your first real indication that this issue is not going away. But also second, when the bill did not pass in the House, Dan Patrick made the comment, our Lieutenant Governor, that he felt like those who did not support the bill maybe spiked the football a little bit too hard when it went down in the House. And he publicly proclaimed this issue will be back I, I want to say he even went as far as to say this will be Senate Bill 2 next session. So it, it's very likely that we're going to see it again. And, and speaking of items that we see on a, on a regular basis, we'll move now to debt transparency and election legislation. Uh, for those of you who've been watching, beginning kind of in 2013 and every session thereafter, the legislatures make debt transparency and election reform surrounding uh, debt issuance as a significant focus. Uh, and I think the reason for this is that there's a view among some quarters of the legislature that all debt is inherently bad um, and that the only reason the public ever approves debt issuances is that they aren't adequately informed about what they're voting on. Um, and I think this group of legislatures has put forward numerous initiatives to limit amount of debt that's approved at elections and is additionally focused on really severely limiting the amount of non-voted debt uh, that can be issued. And I think a number of misconceptions generally underlie their opposition. First, I think there's a view among some that entities are issuing long-term debt for equipment, equipment maintenance, and general operations purposes. And in that, they're conflating the issuance of debt for infrastructure, which is done for all, by all political, Texas political subdivisions, with borrowing to pay the bills, which the federal government does. Um, and there, there's a really important distinction between those two, but it's one we've had a lot of trouble educating uh, legislators on. Another common misconception is that issuers undertake projects with voted debt to fall outside of the bounds of the propositions that voters approve. As, as all of you know on this phone call, that's not something uh, that generally goes on. And a third common misconception is that issuers load up their debt propositions on the May uniform election date in order to hide debt, debt propositions from voters. Um, and, and again, that's, that's simply uh, a misconception. 
So this session, we saw a number of bills that address local government debt, but something that really differentiated this session from the past two sessions or three sessions was the legislature's willingness that was really led by Representative Murphy to work with issuers to find some common ground on some of these issues. And so together, House Bill 440 uh, and House Bill 477 addressed a pretty broad cross-section um, of local government debt matters. So we'll start with House Bill 440 and talk about what it does a little bit. House Bill 440 addresses limitations for school districts on the use of unspent tax bond proceeds. What it does is it allows them to use um, to be used for specific purposes for which they were authorized to retire bonds or for another purpose other than the specific purpose for which they were originally authorized um, if the other specific purposes were actually accomplished or abandoned and the board approves by a separate vote that specific purpose. So that's what you could do with leftover, with leftover funds. Um, Given the way that school district bond propositions have traditionally been structured, this isn't really an issue because you had one proposition for all of the projects that you were ultimately going to do. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how this works uh, in light of SB 30, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment, which changes the way that school district bond propositions have to be presented on the ballot. So this is one to, one to keep an eye on. For other political subdivisions, HB 440 allows unspent general obligation proceeds to be used for other than their specific purposes uh, for retiring bonds um, or another purpose if it's approved at an election. So it's, I think it's unlikely that that provision will be used very often because once you get finished with those specific purposes, why revote something you've already voted as opposed to having a new proposition dealing with the issue? So I think it's unlikely that we'll see that used particularly uh, often. In the election reform context, it requires the posting of a sample ballot prepared for the election on the district's website for the 21 days prior to the election. And I wanted to highlight that because that's effective for this 29, November 2019 election. Uh, so people need to be uh, aware of that. And then in order to address some perceived abuses on the issuance of debt for equipment and short-lived assets, um, House Bill 440 adopts a useful life limitation for general obligation bonds that are issued uh, by an issuer. Now, I will say the, the interesting piece of this is that the provision mirrors the existing federal tax rules. Uh, and as a result, it shouldn't have a significant effect on most issuers of tax exempt debt because you were, you were issuing tax exempt debt for periods of time where the useful life generally matched uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the average life of the bonds. Um, so, you're in a situation where I think it's going to be really unchanged. The only place where it could really make a difference is in taxable bonds. And even then, districts have been very focused and, and other issuers have been very focused at making sure that those useful life um, and, and life of the bonds match up pretty well. So I, I think it'll have very little impact overall, but it does address the concern that there were some that were, were abusing uh, the issue. Turning to House Bill 477, it addresses a number of the other hot button topics that related to debt. Uh, first, it makes text, technical clarifications to the requirements for the content of a bond election order, ordinance, or resolution. And then it also specifies the requirements for the content of ballot language. Now, the, what it's specifying is generally consistent with the prior practice. And this was an important aspect of what went on during the session because there was a big push to get a lot of information related to tax rate impact added to the ballot. And ultimately, um, Representative Murphy and others working on the bill um, agreed to a compromise as it relates to that, and that is for political subdivisions with at least 250 registered voters, there's a requirement for the preparation of a voter information document um, for each proposition. And so the voter information document is going to have to contain specific information, including estimated tax impacts of the bonds. And that voter information document has to be posted on the issuer's website along with the election order ballot language and the sample ballot. So it's going to be broadly distributed. But the points that I'd make to those on the, uh, on the call are that the development of a widely circulated voter information document is going to take a lot of preparation and prior thought. And so you're going to want to set aside some time in your bond issuance process and the election process for actually creating this document and really thinking carefully about how you're going to craft that document. It's going to take the input of your municipal advisor, your CFOs, uh, the, and, and bond counsel as you work through that. 
It's also important to note that this voter information document is truly a voter information document that's going to be presented along with your other election materials. And so as a result, we think uh, initially that the language minority provisions of the Voting Rights Act are going to require it to be translated into all the languages that you have to translate uh, your other election related materials. So there'll be some additional time and expense associated with that, and that needs to be built into uh, the process. Uh, these election related changes uh, all become effective with the May 2020 election. So you're not going to be dealing with those in the November 2019 election. You're looking out to May 2020. Finally, House Bill 477 addresses certificates of obligation. There's been a long focus on COs as, as non-voted debt. Uh, and for COs, this, that now lengthens the notice period to uh, needing to be posted before the 45th day before the date of adoption of an ordinance or order approving the COs. It adds a web, website posting requirement, and it adds financial disclosures for the notice. So this change also extends to the petition. It, it also has a, the, the effect of extending the petition period for COs as well. So before you had a 30-day petition period, now you have a 45-day uh, petition period. Um, so for issuers, I want you to know you're going to see a number of changes to the notice of intent and your notice of intent resolution. One of them that you'll see is that there are some adjustments for um, in the disclosures related to debt that allow you to take out self-supporting debt. And we're still trying to figure out what self-supporting debt means with the Office of the Attorney General. So there's some so ongoing discussions related to that, and we'll keep you uh, informed on those points. Um, Senate Bill 30. Uh, the next one we'd like to talk about, it had, um, it was a major priority bill uh, in the Senate, and it, um, it aimed at cracking down on what authors viewed as abuses in the way propositions were structured. Uh, so ultimately, it makes significant changes to the scope and contents of bond propositions for school districts. So beginning with the May 2020 election, SB 30 is going to require separate propositions for state, certain stadiums, natatoriums, certain recreational facilities, performing arts facilities, teacher housing, and certain technology equipment. For political subdivisions other than school district, it establishes guidelines for the contents of the bond proposition that are centered on propositions being for a single specific purpose. And then it goes on to define single specific purpose as one or more structures or improvements serving the substantially same purpose and also potentially including related improvements and equipment necessary to accomplish that specific purpose. So there's some significant questions uh, created by SB 30 on what's meant by the restrictions. Um, the AG's Public uh, Finance Division recently circulated an all-bond council uh, letter that uh, asked issuers to um, submit uh, their analysis of what SB 30 meant, and they're going to ultimately put out some additional analysis on, um, on what SB 30 means before the May 2020 election cycle uh, begins. The other thing I would say is that same AEG uh, All Bond Council letter addresses a number of the election related um, laws and when they become effective and how they're going to be treated by the AG's office. So I recommend that to anyone who has uh, an election upcoming. Um, skipping ahead to HB 2826, just a quick note on that. Um, it is a bill that adds a new requirement for the approval of contingent fee legal contracts. And that includes contingent fee contracts for bond counsel. So there's special um, special process that you'll have to go through for approving um, those types of contracts, just to make you aware of that. And then on the continued debt transparency, toll roads have been long been a major topic of uh, the legislature. Uh, this session, many of the toll ro road related legislation failed to pass, uh, but one that did pass was this requirement that a toll entity pu published on its website financial data, including the final maturity date of outstanding bonds, toll revenue for each toll project, an accounting total uh, of total revenue and its adopted or proposed capital improvement plan with one in 180 days after the end of the fiscal year. And then finally, in this uh, category, uh, House Bill 304 made a number of changes uh, related to municipal management districts. One that I would point out from an election, from a bond standpoint, was that it prohibits a municipal management district board from calling a bond election unless a petition requesting the election was submitted by a majority of the owners of assessed value of property in the district. So that's a pretty significant, uh, pr pretty significant change. And so with that, since we've seen these same bills session after session, and we actually had some that passed the session addressing these issues. Rick, what, talk to us a little bit about what failed, and are, are we going to see it again? 
Yeah, so there was quite a bit on this topic that did fail to be passed into law, which I personally think was a tremendous victory for those professions and those entities that utilize public financing, um, specifically bills to require only November uniform election dates could be used for debt issuance elections. There was even one file that went as far as to say only even numbered year November elections could be used, as well as bills that would acquire minimum amount of voter participation, voter turnout, in order for a debt issuance election to be certified. And, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, that um, constitutional amendment elections are typically low turnout affairs. In the 2017 constitutional amendment election, we had a voter turnout of less than 6%. I know that because the, the coalition that we both work on, Coalition for Responsible Infrastructure Finance, we had to use that talking point over and over during the last legislative session to make the, the, the case of, look, if 6% is good enough to amend the state constitution, then why is it that something in that neighborhood is not good enough to issue local debt? Um, but there were also bills filed to require, uh, you know, supermajority public vote that 51% would no longer, would not have been good enough for approval. As well as you mentioned earlier, uh, attempts, whether they were genuine or inadvertent, to limit the use of certificates of obligation. Um, these were those and others were measures that we saw filed that we had to spend significant time and resources working on during the legislative session. And I would just say to those who are listening that this issue is not going away. In fact, my sincere guess is with the legislature feeling like they have now conquered property taxes, next up is public debt. Public debt next session will be the SB2 that we saw during this legislative session. And if you are a school district who is looking, who is listening to this, you need to get involved. You need to be a member of the Texas Association of School Board Officials. If you're a municipality, you need to be involved in TML. If you are bond council or an invest financial institution who's listening to this, you need to get involved with the Coalition of Responsible Infrastructure Finance because this is going to be the marquee reform issued for the next legislative session. And without strong coordinated advocacy, we will see significant bills passed in 2021 that either through direct intention or unintended consequences are going to take the form of taking public finance off the table altogether. Thanks, Rick. On that happy note, we'll, uh, we'll turn the page to uh, public information and, uh, and, and open meetings. Uh, so in addition to what we saw um, on, on debt coming back, session after session. This session was also notable for a number of pieces of significant legislation, legislation touching on the Public Information Act and the Open Meetings Act, and some of these we had seen in prior sessions. Shannon, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, those bills? Yes. Senate Bill 943 by Watson uh, was a bill that passed. Uh, they tried to pass it last session, and it didn't go. This session, we worked with a, a big group of, of, of interested parties to address the Boeing versus the uh, Greater Houston Partnership decision, and basically what this bill did, it expands um, third-party vendors and contracts to the open to open records in certain circumstances. Uh, it didn't go near as far as the uh, public information people wanted. It went a little further than I think what a lot of contractors and third-party individuals would have hoped, but it, in our opinion, it was kind of a fair balance between those two. So it does address uh, contracting information. Senate Bill 944, again, was a, one of the bills that was had a lot of discussion during the interim through a lot of interested parties. And what it does is it really conforms to advice that we have given for years and years that says if you use your private uh, cell or your private laptop or anything private for public business, then it's subject to the Public Information Act. That just because you conduct business on your personal uh, PDAs does not mean that it's exempt. 
but like I said, for municipal officials, we have given that advice for at least the last 20 years, uh, and this just codifies it. Uh, Senate Bill 1640 uh, by Watson, it, this bill passed as well, and it was in response to a court of, of appeals opinion that, in Doyle versus State that said that the criminal conspiracy provision of the Open Meetings Act was unconstitutional. The court had said that criminal penalties, uh, particularly imprisonment, are really not necessary in order to properly and effectively um, or functions of open meeting laws. You don't have to put somebody in jail in order to uh, have good uh, open meetings laws. Uh, interesting enough, this does not apply to legislators. There was a comment made by one legislator before he was silenced is that, well, we could never do business if we had to live with this. So of course, they exempted legislators. Uh, but what the bill goes forward and says, I'm talking about a walking quorum because that was the whole gist of the whole uh, lawsuit, was that you still cannot intend to circumvent the law. So you can't take uh, three out of five people, go to the restroom and decide that you know what the answer is to a question. So you just cannot purposely circumvent the law, but they did take out uh, the imprisonment provisions. So those are three bills that we were um, happy to get off our plate and that we felt like were reasonable compromises in the process. Great, thank you. And then outside of the open meetings and Public Information Act context, there were a couple other general transparency bills that we just wanna to call to your attention. You'll see them in the slide. It's HB 305, um, which is some general information uh, related to uh, elections and officials. Um, and then HB 793, which made some clarifications and limitations on the boycott Israel uh, provisions that all the governmental entities have been uh, dealing with. So you'll find those in, inside of your packet. Um, as we get to some other bills of interest, I think uh, a, a major one is SB 7. Um, and, and it's a bill that establishes two new accounts, uh, the Flood Infrastructure Fund and the Texas Infrastructure Resiliency Fund, and broadens the type of contracts that can be funded through the Texas Water Development Board's uh, research and planning programs um, to work related to planning for flood protection. And the bill also, also authorizes the Texas Water Development Board to issue revenue bonds for both new accounts. So this is associated with um, one of the uh, constitutional amendments that we mentioned earlier. I would also note that the uh, Water Development Board is actually in the process of doing a number of meetings and community um, community involvement and, and participation uh, activities. And so if your entity is interested in these programs and helping guide the creation of those programs on an administrative level, look for those emails or reach out to the Water Development Board. There's a, there's a lot going on with respect to that. Um, Shannon, I wanted to kick over to you and, and see what you had to say about um, SB 1152. Senate Bill 1152 by Hancock uh, is a version of a cable and telecom bill that's kind of the son of a bill uh, that passed last session, Senate Bill 1004, that had to do with franchise fees. Uh, this bill said that a city only has to pay the lowest fee of either the cable provider or the telecommunications company, the rental fees are in your right of way. Um, the bill uh, is very significant for a lot of cities in that it will uh, half the amount of money that cities get from managing the right-of-way. We strongly believe it's unconstitutional and we will certainly um, sue in order to make sure um, that that this uh, law is overturned. We'll probably tack it on to Senate Bill 1004. Uh, to, to consolidate into one. So that is a that is something that we worked on and will follow through with litigation. Another bill that I want to mention that is very important to cities is House Bill 2439. This bill says that a city cannot regulate building materials that are authorized by the National Building Code. In other words, if, you, if the National Building Code says you can use brick, stone, metal, vinyl, hardy plank, whatever, in order to build a house, then a city cannot come in and say that you can only have stone or you can only have brick that you can now build a building that has hardy plank or vinyl or metal uh, in the middle of, of any neighborhood. Uh, there was a lot of opposition after the bill was signed into law by a lot of builders, developers who realized that this is really seriously going to impact the aesthetics in a lot of high-end communities. They're very concerned about that. The only exceptions to that are cities that have dark sky regulations or historical landmarks. 
Um, this is something that legislators have already told us that they are going to come back and revisit uh, next session uh, because of the impacts that it will have on, on neighborhoods across the state. Um, and other bills of interest, House Bill 3143 by Murphy and West ex ex extends the expiration date of Chapter 312 uh, in the Property Redevelopment and Tax Abatement Act. Uh, it was set to expire September of this year. It has now been extended for 10 years. Uh, but there will be additional hearing requirements and it also gives a 30 day notice that you have to give a 30 day notice when extending your chapter 312. What we firmly believe is that these will not happen anymore at all, not because of the 30 day requirement, but because of Senate Bill 2. Because of the lack of money that cities will now experience, um, chapter 312 uh, propositions will not be used and also the chapter 380 agreements that have been used in the past in lieu of Chapter 312 also will probably not be used um, to any extent imaginable because you can these count against your rollback rate in that computation of the 3.5. So two huge economic development tools that have been uh, very viable for cities in the past are now going to be virtually unused. Um, so as we as we kind of wrap things up today, I, I want to give the panel a, a chance to talk a little bit about what you expect to see in the interim? Are there any areas of emphasis that, uh, that that you can see us having to address? I think as far as it pertains to this audience, we can strongly expect that the House Ways and Means Committee will very likely take up an interim charge that pertains to non-voted debt, uh, particularly COs, but others as well. Chairman Burroughs, who I think does deserve some credit, um, some, some hard-earned credit, for working with stakeholders on the CO issue as it pertained to Senate Bill 2. He, he did demonstrate a willingness to listen, learn, better understand, and then amend that bill. Um, but he has indicated that he wants to have more conversations about non-voted debt. So I, I would expect we're going to see that in front of Ways and Means. Amanda, anything from your end? I would expect uh, school districts to spend the interim working to implement House Bill 3 um, and as districts work through that process and TEA works through that process, um, I think any time you pass a bill that sweeping and significant, you're going to need cleanup legislation next session just to address some unintended consequences as we go forward. And then, Shanna, what, uh, what about from a municipal standpoint? Anything beyond the non-voted debt piece that uh, Rick was talking about in the interim? Uh, no, I think that probably capsulates is what we are most looking at as far as what the big issue is going to be. And of course, like Rick said earlier, what we're going to have to happen next session is, of course, taxpayer, taxpayer funded lobbying. So we'll just see where that goes. Yeah. And I think one of the things we, we talked about as we were preparing for this webinar today was just the importance of local governmental entities, particularly people on councils and school boards and commissioners' courts, talking with their legislators during the interim about issues and how these bills are affecting them and how if there's an interim charge, what that interim charge actually means. Because what we found during session was the most effective advocates for local governmental positions were those elected officials. Absolutely. Yeah, who have the opportunity to go and talk. And so if, if you are in a particular governmental body um, or if you're a resident and you see some issues that came up from legislation that were passed this session, say SB 30, we end up having a lot of trouble in implementation of SB 30. Um, that's something that that educational process, the earlier you can start that outside of the rush of session, uh, the more effective you'll be in, in helping set kind of, uh, kind of priorities. Now, that's absolutely true. You know, the thing about the people in Austin, we can tell you where the bill's at, what the bill does what the lay of the land is, but as far as effectively making sure your legislator understands, it only comes from the local officials, be it a city, county, school, hospital district. That is where they will actually listen. Uh, so the people in Austin are there, just there to tell you what's going on and where. You're the ones out there in their districts that they will listen to. I think a great case in point, you know, we were talking offline about the new building code requirement that was passed during the session and how there is a, a reasonable likelihood the legislature will come back and look at that issue next session after they have received such thorough uh, feedback from their city councilmen and mayors as to the potential detrimental impacts of that bill. So that, 
that's one ironclad example of where direct advocacy at the local level does have a good, meaningful impact. Right. So with that, we want to thank everybody for attending the webinar today. We really appreciate your time and attention. We'd also really like to thank our outstanding panelists, uh, your willingness to share your expertise and insights. Um, and finally, if you have any questions about what we covered today, please contact your Bracewell lawyer, or if you look at the back of the uh, webinar, you have uh, email addresses for all of us who are participating uh, today. We'd love to, uh, love to hear from you and talk with you. And so again, thank you very much and uh, have a great afternoon.